Great. So um, hello and welcome everyone uh, to a conversation about financial planning and an economic downturn. Obviously a very topical item to discuss uh, given all of the news in the market. But, you know, the first thing to start with really for everyone is that, you know, the sky isn't falling. The economic recalibration that we're going through is not unprecedented. The challenges are certainly real and the difficult financial choices that companies need to make are real. But the good news is that these are not uncharted waters. There's lots of discussion, obviously, in the market about the need to reduce expenses and to extend cash runway. But yet what we've observed is that there's actually not a heck of a lot of discussion about the means by which to achieve these objectives. And the good news further is that there are many financial leaders that have weathered these situations in the past. We could all remember the challenges of 2001, 2008, and the companies that navigated through those oftentimes prevailed, even in those difficult situations. And so that's the topic for this conversation. My name is Dave Zolman. I'm a general partner at Norwest Venture Partners. We are a early and mid-stage investment fund with a 60-year history of partnering with entrepreneurs. Um, I myself have been a direct investor for 16 years, five years of experience as an entrepreneur and an investment banker, and have certainly managed through multiple economic cycles. But more specifically, we've invited three fantastic financial leaders that have been in the arena during these difficult times and have very valuable lessons learned that we hope to share with all of you today. So the folks joining us are Laura Perone. Laura is currently the CFO of Salona, which is a Norwest portfolio company in the wireless space. It's a, um, it's a physical goods company. So there's a unique perspective about inventory that uh, she'll have a point of view on. Uh, Laura was previously CFO and VP finance at startup companies such as Mist Systems, Picaro, and Omnion. Um, Mike Dinsdale is currently the managing director of Acadian, which is focused on alternative liquidity solutions for entrepreneurs and investors. Mike was previously CFO at Gusto, DoorDash, and DocuSign, where Mike and I had the great pleasure of working together. And Robert Park, who is currently CFO of Dolby Laboratories, um, Robert previously held positions of CFO and VP Finance at some companies such as Blue Jeans Networks, Practice Fusion, Chegg, PayPal, and McKesson. So, you know, let's let's jump into the conversation. And as we go through this conversation, we'll step through the different phases of financial planning and, and financial cash management. But before we get started with the tactics of the, the, the current environment, I thought it'd be prudent for us to talk a little bit about sort of the foundational aspects of financial planning. So we'll kick off with you, Laura. We'd love to hear from you, you know, as you're going through ordinary course of business, financial planning and forecasting, what are the three main factors that you consider in creating a financial plan? Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks, Dave, for the intro. I, I think of things from three different vectors. Um, the first would be top line, right? If if you are in a revenue mode, in a, a shipping mode, um, then taking into consideration what the right TCB target is to me is paramount. And thinking through what the growth metric is, such as ARR growth multiple, like what am I trying to achieve? So I think about the top line in terms of how much of the TCB can convert to ARR. How do I make that as, as high as possible so that ARR growth multiple um, is healthy? What does the coverage ratio look like in the pipeline, right? Just how much traction do we have? What kind of sales coverage do we have, right? I have metrics that suggest that we have to have an over application of quota to TCB. And I wanna make sure that I've got the sellers there to achieve the objective. Um, I think in, in our preamble, Dave, you made a great point about who wants to finance a no growth company, right? You can, you can runway yourself to death. Um, it is a plane that's taking off and you just have to know, you know, when, when to lift. Um, so I really focus on, on that top line. You know, what does IDC say? What does Gardner say from a TAM standpoint? What SAM is attainable? What, 
you know, what um, market share is reasonable, right? So when I look out three or four years, I say, okay, let me say it's 2% of the market share, or, you know, whatever, whatever your industry represents. So the, that whole concept of top line is, is paramount. And then I try to match that with having enough productive capacity to achieve the objective, right? Do we, you know, just do we have the sellers? Do we have the supply chain team? As you mentioned, I, I deal with what I call uh, SaaS forward hardware. And so there is the supply chain element of it. So just productive capacity. Do we have the engineering man months required to achieve what's in that product roadmap? You know, are we kidding ourselves? Can we, can we afford um, our appetite? for growth do we have those places um those pieces in place and then what are the working capital requirements right and how can i finance it um through all kinds of things obviously through operational inflows from cash receipts but um having good friends in the banking community helps to say what kind of leverage instruments make sense for this business a revolving line of credit using ar as collateral inventory as collateral all the different financing elements i'm sure we'll speak to later but those are the the three vectors that i consider and then um i just said this the other day i can't decide if it's a rubik's cube or i'm paying sudoku all all day but <laughs> it, it is just a matter of trying to trying to find the right combination of events that will achieve the objective and and stay agile Got it. That's great. Well, you know, that, that gets us to a really great point, uh, Laura. Um, there's this, you know, increasing discussion in the industry about dynamic finance, right? The concept of transforming finance into a flexible, agile function where the inputs are constantly changing. And so therefore the outputs of the financial model need to represent that as well, which isn't necessarily the way financial budgets were established in the past, you set an annual plan and you execute towards it. Um, and I guess, you know, turning to Mike, your experience from your vantage point, love to hear, what do you think about kind of a dynamic finance function where the variables are changing? And so therefore you're adapting in real time and, you know, effectuating change based on this constant dynamic change. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thanks, Dave. Good to see you. I think last time we spoke, we were only on the phone. And so I'll say you look exactly the same as you did 10 years ago. <laughs> <I can tell. laughs> yeah. Good lighting, uh, Mike. Good lighting. Yeah, well, you know, but but good to see you. And, and Laura and Robert, good to meet you. Um, maybe we'll go back to, to the first question a little bit. There's something else I think we need to add. So I think with, with all of the, the things that we're doing, we're building growth companies. And so we have to zoom up for a second and look at the long term. And so, you know, to me, that means what does the company look like in five years and where do we want to be and how do we want to look? And so this start, you know, top down, like forget about it, just white, you know, white sheet of paper. What's the ideal? And then what are the, the, the key metrics along the way for us to look like that? Right. And that's bringing in comps as well, because at the end of the day, we are competing against peer companies, um, not just in our own in our own market. But we're competing for dollars from from all the venture folks and then eventually the crossovers and public markets and so on. And so we want to look the best company we possibly can and then all the metrics that they're going to look at to judge us five years from now, what are those? And, and growth rates and all the things that we want to achieve over the next X years. And then how do we look better than any other company? Maybe that's you know, ARR per engineer or you know, ARR per employee or whatever, it, whatever the metrics are. But really start with that and then have the strategic discussion with whatever set of folks make sense. So all of that sort of work around tops down and what are the key things or the top five things we need to change as a company to achieve those and then work backwards with what those metrics need to look like you know over the next five years to achieve this help help as a cfo help explain why this matters and then get into kind of the the bottoms up and this gets into the the, the dynamic part but the bottoms up I've, i used to say and i haven't been a cfo for a couple of years um but just standardize and templatize everything when you get into the, the bottoms up planning with departments and set boundaries per, per group. In my, you know, the most successful planning process I've gone through, I've set boundaries. So it's not, it's not just a, a clean sheet of paper for a department and make all the asks you want, but we have financial constraints. Your plan has to fit into that period. And then you can have above plan asks, and then we can get together as a group across all departments and assess which ones of those make sense. But I've seen people make mistakes where they send out the sort of budget templates and they get back asked to equal, you know, twice what we have in, in growth expense 
and that doesn't work. And then you're spending your entire time as a finance person going back and telling people why they need to cut this and cut that. So I've always made it a hard line that says your plan has to come back hitting your financial target, period. No exceptions, period. And then you can have a separate ask that may or may not get funded, but it's going to be relative to all the other initiatives tied to the strategies, key metrics, and so on that we want to achieve going forward. But that's super important. And it's so simple. And I see so many people fail doing that because I'm not exactly sure why. But just have, have some idea of what makes sense for each group. And it's just a starting point. You know, you don't have to be perfect at this either. But at least you're then starting from an expansion standpoint with capital versus not. And then I have always liked to hold back some amount so that there is, you know, some adjustment on the fringes that doesn't require you to go back and have people replan. But, I, you know, again, to just say those terms, standardize and templatize, it just makes your job as a finance person 100 times easier that each department or whatever budgeting group provides the exact same documents to you. So if that's key metrics that are related to their department, how those metrics interact with the key metrics for the company, what are the interdependencies between groups, like you're counting on this to achieve that, blah, 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 to make sure that it's something you know, is out there that someone doesn't come back six months from now and say, well, I couldn't do that because so-and-so didn't do this. You know, what are those things? So at least people are aware of them and they're thinking about what they're being counted on to do to help others as well. But I think that's the, the, the key is really start with this, this high level, what do we want to look like over five years? And that obviously is refreshed you know, each year. So you always have this sort of outward looking uh, forecast and then get down at the bottoms up and tie that across and make sure that it all, you know, it all aligns and fits together. In terms of dynamic, you know, I've gone back and forth on this in my career and, you know, getting to this, this sort of holy grail ideal of always having, you know, one full year forward done or having some sort of rolling quarter forecast or something like this, it never, it never actually worked. And so for me, I've always done long-term plan. So the five-year thing we just talked about. And in terms of rolling, do an H1 plan. And then at H2, refresh, do H2 plan, have quarterly check-ins. But in the H2 plan, look forward into the forward year. So the H2 plan is the first time you start thinking about the roll forward into the next year. And you know, there, the, the biggest watch out for everybody is making sure that run rate expense doesn't exceed next year OPEX, right? Because this is obviously a trap that people fall into. And it, it, it's good to start to have groups think about, okay, my year end expense is X. What does that mean that I have in, in expansion in the forward year? Or maybe I have nothing. You know, and that, that starts to, to set the conversation for budgeting for the, for the forward year. But that's what I've done most successfully has been H1, H2 with H2 looking forward into forward year. Um, and, then, and then clearly everyone has to have a real time forecast all the time. You know, that's, mm -hmm. changes, that's not a plan, that's a forecast. So you really understand where the variances are across, you know, the, the different groups. And if you have to make a course correction or not, you know, there's some, some gates that, that you go through in the year where expenses are either released or, or pulled back, you know, depending on the severity of whatever, whatever it is. But, you know, I'll just leave again with calendarize and standardize. And I hope everyone takes that and drives that into your finance teams because it'll just make your life a hundred times easier. Got it. That's great. Robert, I'd love to hear your point of view on, on some of these comments about establishing forecast and also sort of a dynamic finance function. Yeah, I agree with Mike. I always start with the five-year plan and, and your next year's plan should be a page out of that five-year plan. And either you're on track or you're not on track. And and you had a whole year to figure out why, what worked, what didn't work. Um, and then I usually do a current course and speed. You kind of know if you just did the same things you did before, conversion rates, pipeline, marketing, uh, GTM, you could see kind of what that line might look like. And then you have to look at what are the drivers that could change that? How many levers, how many knobs could you turn to increase the velocity and improve the metrics? over time and then how confident are you in those in those things because i think you've said a holdback is important because stuff's going to come up and you don't want to have to go back to eight elt members and say okay i need to take from here to fund this uh, you just want something along the side i call it a uld in the budget unlocated difference it's something that doesn't tie to anything but i know it's there um to be able to adjust as as the facts go um in terms of agile planning i mean i was at paypal and during 2008. And um, when I think about how often you need to plan and forecast, it depends on your business and the level of uncertainty. The more uncertainty, the more you better plan. Um, and in 2008, there was nothing but uncertainty, kind of like today. Nobody can predict the future. When are we going to get out of this slump or, or um, 
slow period here. And so the more uncertainty, the more you have to plan. I mean, we had an annual plan at PayPal, but because the facts were changing so quickly, we created quarterly targets based on current results because your, your annual plan was stale within three months, totally stale, both from a top line and a bottom line perspective, exchange rates, consumer behavior, weather, um, changing your trajectory. So trying to stick to the annual plan was kind of a fool's errand. So what we had was we had an annual plan, which we allocate resources to, and then you look at your quarterly results and you create targets for the next quarter for everybody. So if you beat your number in Q1 by a mile, you don't get to settle on Q2 being the original plan for Q2. Your Q2 just went up. Um, and if we missed on top line, your expenses for Q2 are not entitlements. We'll adjust that down and say, you guys didn't hit your targets. We're on the wrong trajectory until we see the right trajectory. Um, we're going to adjust uh, spending. So the agility depends on the uncertainty in your business and how much the market landscape impacts your business. If it's a steady business with long-term contracts and you're just adding new layers, you may not have to plan as often, but in a transactional business where you have high velocity, you've got to plan quite often. Maybe one other thing that I want to make sure is clear. When I was saying the H1, H2, I was agreeing with Robert that it's still still monthly and quarterly you know, targets in the plan that we're, we're uh, looking at variances against. Something else that I think that's, that's really important for all the companies we're involved with, it's headcount. And headcount's one of the things there has to be a disciplined process in place. And if someone has a positive variance, it doesn't mean any more headcount. I mean, they don't have the flexibility to add heads and they don't have the flexibility to pull heads forward. So there's just got to be you know, guidelines around how and when people can initiate hires depending on variance, because that's the thing that ends up being the biggest problem when we get into downturns like this is reducing headcount. And thinking about, you know, just, just that specific topic at Gusto, when we went through a thousand replans uh, when COVID hit in 2020, because, you know, we're in a business focused on small, small businesses and the, all of a sudden COVID happens and everyone's stuck in their houses, you know, Main Street basically shut down and we thought we were going to go from 50% growth to five or possibly negative. And so what's, what was interesting and to get ties back to the headcount is we didn't hire anybody all year and nothing changed. The economy didn't impact us nearly as much as we thought. We grew at 50% with less heads than we would have otherwise, <laughs> no impact. And I think that's a huge learning that almost every single growth business has too many people, period. Um, because each year the, the general thought is, well, how many more people do I get? Right? And I think tying back to the long-term long -term plans, you know, point out to folks, that there's a lot of companies that drive huge ARR with very few people and winning is not more people. Winning is less people with bigger numbers um, and being more efficient and, and getting more from each person. And that's not about working harder, obviously, because nobody likes to necessarily hear that, even though that's partially true. But, you know, the headcount piece is really important to make sure that you have, you know, discipline around that. And then as a CFO, you have control of this. You know, it's the, it's the biggest and easiest place to get in trouble and the hardest to get to change. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Mike. In an environment where cash is cheap, the requirement for efficiency isn't as high because you could just raise more capital and you can continue to grow inefficiently. But yeah. these capital constraints in environments require companies to be just much more focused and also be more efficient with the way that they spend. And, and maybe, maybe to the point you were making, it's not working harder, it's working smarter. And what's more efficient? What's really essential for the business to achieve as you outline the five-year plan? What are your objectives? What are your goals? And to work backwards from there. Um, Robert, I wanted to pick up on a comment you made just about at PayPal and how things were changing very quickly and you had to adapt. I guess, you know, the, the one headline that I always think about is that, you know, humans, we're optimists by nature. That's how we survive. And so when things start to deteriorate, we largely remain optimistic and we hope that things will get better. In the current economic environment, it seems to have changed overnight. But the reality is the buildup has been months in the making. Same thing in 2008, same thing in 2001. And so the question then is, what are the signals that you look for to actually make changes? Um, you know, like, and, and you know, and specifically, I think of things like sales pipeline or you know, sales conversion or DSO, bad debt, these types of things. What should the attendees on this call really think about and measure in order to start making changes? 
Yeah, it's a great question. I, I, you know, it goes back to the saying, there's three types of people in this world, you know, people who make things happen, people who watch things happen, and then people wonder what the hell happened. You know, if you're in that third bucket, that's like the, the boiled frog syndrome where you either don't have the ability or willingness to change to adapting and adapt to, you know, the changing landscape around you. The signals are there. It's like that 1983 movie, The Man of Two Brains, and he's looking at the painting, give me a sign, give me any sign. And the room is shaking and spinning. And he looks at, give me just any sign. Basically, the signs are there, but you don't want to see them and, and, and you ignore them or aren't willing to change. So you can see those indicators. It seems to be these changes seem to happen overnight, but there are always signals. Um, and, and the leading indicator, yes, pipeline and conversion could be that a good way to look at it. But I always take pipeline and conversion with a grain of salt, because if you compensate and, and measure people on pipeline, you're always going to get growth in pipeline. It'll be crap, but they'll say, I've created more pipeline. And then if you switch to, okay, we'll switch to conversion. Then you'll get a smaller pipeline of only deals that they know they're going to close because conversion will go up. But what you can't really manipulate as much is bookings, deals done, velocity of deals, average size deals, um, average length of the deals. Those things um, you can't manipulate as much because finance has a bigger control over that. And you can see deals are getting smaller. Your net dollar retentions are going down. That's the first one. When your customers are starting to renew for less or or not expand as much as they used to, that's that's my first indicator are your current customers. Um, uh, velocity, deal size, gross and net churn, those are your kind of things you need to watch for. If you start to see deceleration, um, your spidey sense should come up. Uh, good CFOs have spidey sense, and it may not be just the data, but you've got to provide a little bit of judgment in that as well. I also look at customer, partner. If they're public, what are they saying? If they're saying, hey, I, uh, we're having a tough year, uncertainty in the future, and if they're a customer, you can expect that to trickle down to you. When their renewal is up, they're going to squeeze you for a flat renewal, no renewal, uh, cheaper price, put it up for RFP. Those are the kind of things that you need to look for in the ecosystem beyond just your internal metrics. So if your judgment is dominated by metric, you're not providing any judgment. So I think a big part of being a CFO is providing that judgment and sounding board beyond just the metrics. Um, again, you got to look for internal and external thermometers uh, because if you just talk to sales, one more quarter, just one more quarter, um, and then before you know it, you got to you know you got to take a bigger cut. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, Laura, you're you're on the edge of your seat. It looks like you 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 have some perspective here. I imagine. Uh, I'll reinforce uh, a few of the things that were said. Um, Hundred percent agree that. You have to give guardrails on top down. Otherwise, you'll just just turn your wheel in 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 futility. Um, back pockets, 100%. There has to be some um, set aside that you can do for things that seem to be the most pressing. Um, Headcount is in my world for forever been about 67 to 70% of total spend. If you control that, you control everything. And one of the um, habits we get into is just assuming that we will replace um, someone who's exited the business. And, and so those replacement wrecks to me come back on a zero base justification. Why would we want to replace this exit? Um, I think that comes habitual and you might have a, a higher priority skill that you have to bring into the business. And the other concept here is just with that spidey sense, Robert, um, you, you can feel it, you know it, you sense it, the data supports it. Um, taking action earlier on people in the business that are not P1 priority to the objectives at hand, I would address that. It's painful. Um, but the longer you wait to transition out under performers, that, that skill set just isn't needed in this moment. Um, or I have, I have a net trade, right? I have a talent that I want to bring into this business to help further an objective, but I don't have the burn. Well, then we have to, you know, we have to make a trade. It's like a sports team, right? I have two left-handers. I need a right-hander. Um, but what I find is waiting for clarity only costs you more because you have three or four months of salary that you've invested and then you have to deal with the period cost of a severance. So when things are clear, um, humanely, 
I believe in reassessing who's on the field, what are their talents, what do we need, and and trading, making making some trades. You know, one, one thing I had to add on on that that didn't get mentioned is looking at the, the macro environment and thinking about how it will impact your business or if there's signals that you can measure. And so a great example of that is, is again, at Gusto. And this is a company that's focused on small, medium-sized businesses. And so new starts matters because there's 400,000 new businesses each year. And those are greenfield and they need to pay people. So as we, when, we, when we went into COVID and we started to look at new business starts, yes, they declined, but not that much actually. And so the point being that there is indicators that are unrelated to our business that we could look at that gave us signal on what was going to happen downstream. And as we started to see that come back or a shift, which is really what started to happen is Main Street businesses shift the desktop businesses, even though the starts didn't decline all that much, which then started to give us signal that it wasn't going to be as bad as we thought for us. But what then we started to see in our own data was that, that companies were smaller. So they started smaller and stayed smaller. So instead of getting to, you know, six, six to eight employees, which is the average for Augusta, they were more like, you know, five to six. And so, so we started, but the point being that there may be things out that are different from your own internal data sources that might give you some input. And then there's this, this optimistic part. I mean, I'm hundred percent an optimist. I know that I get a good example of that is when I was running to catch my last plane to come back home this past trip I was, I was on and I just made it all sweaty. And my, my wife was convinced our suitcase wouldn't make it. And I said, I know it'll make it. And it did. But you know, might not have. So she was already planning on what she would do without it. But where I'm going with that is, you know, if you look at other businesses like DocuSign or DoorDash, as we went through COVID, these are businesses that benefited from it, actually. And so, you know, a lot of times I hear, you know, in the sort of venture community, as soon as anything starts to happen on the on the sort of macro scale, you know, people start sending out these RIP, you know, PowerPoint decks and telling everyone to like run for the hills and cut and don't, don't, you know, don't spend anything because doom is coming. And it may not be for your business. It could actually be something that's positive. I mean, clearly, if you have supply chain issues, well, that's a real problem. Again, and that, that's a signal from, from macro. But if you're in the business like, like DoorDash, where people are staying at home, hmm, could it be good for you? Because they're not going to be going out because they can't. So that means they're probably going to order more. And of course, they did. And DocuSign is a business that that really did well in good or bad times, because when it's a good time, of course, you want to digitally automate all your processes and, and leverage you know, technology that's different uh, from your competitors, and it's no-brainer to spend. But in bad times, hey, you kind of want to kind of spend more efficiently, and so it fits as well. And so sometimes it may not even be that it's going to impact your business as much, but you have to change how you position it when you sell it. And so that's where you should start, right? So maybe it goes from you know benefit in one way to benefit in another way, and it's is retooling your, your go-to-market so that you start to tell a slightly different marketing story. But I think those are all, all important related to, uh, you know, when you look at what's happening in the economy and how you should adjust. I, I agree with that. Um, Dave, you talked a little bit about what Salona does. We, we do private cellular networks. And one of the things that we did was just uh, refocus, um, you know, close our aperture a little bit, do a few things less, take a couple, go to market industries and say, we'll address that a little later. What is the industry that is most appropriate for our product at this time? And it turns out to be industrial and it turns out to be where labor supply is constrained um, and where people are trying to save costs through automation and, and where traditional Wi-Fi doesn't play. And so it's less competitive. Um, and, and so I think that in our preamble, we talked about, do we cut 10% or 15% across the board, right? Is that the most um, democratic way to extend runway? And, and I don't, I, I haven't found that to be true. I have found it to be true to say, let's just um, reduce the aperture of our lens. Let's wait, put a couple of these growth vectors in our back pocket and truly fund the things that are the most important and that uh, we're gonna find the most receptivity for our products and just try to take some of the noise out of, out, of, out of the channel. So I think that's important. And I'll just add one more thing. When we talk about this dynamic um, forecasting, for me, the, the benefit of it is to say, hey, look, I don't think we're gonna hit our burn, right? TCV is a little off this quarter. Um, this or that has occurred. If we don't hit the top line, we have to hit the burn goal, right? So we have to pull back. And we have to pull back in time for it to have the effect in the quarter. 
So that's just always a commitment I keep is, is if, if you can hit your same burn, even if you're going to not hit your top line. Yeah, that's a great point. You know, just one quick thing for the attendees. There is a Q&A uh, in the session. So if you have questions, feel free to ask and I'll raise them with the panelists. Um, so just a public service announcement there. But Laura, you know, to, to your point, uh, maybe double clicking on what you were just talking about, you know, the different plans. And one of the um, sort of guiding principles that I've been discussing with the companies I'm involved with over the past several months is creating scenario scenarios for different circumstances, different situations. If, you know, it, depending on the relevant metric, if it's TCV or ARR, if it comes in at 75% of plan, 50% of plan, 25% of plan, what does that mean to cash runway? What does that mean to uh, the expense requirements for the business? What, what are your thoughts about, you know, the, the number of scenarios that companies should be thinking about? How do they manage? And, 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 the, and, the, and the follow up question is, how specific and actionable should those contingency plans really be? I, I like to think of things as baseline, what I really expect to happen. And then there's an upside and a downside. Um, and I almost approach the operating plan development um, as, as building blocks. And so I think we've talked about the fact that nobody wants to invest uh, in a no growth company. So clearly we have to invest in that top line. And so in a hard goods scenario, SAS with hard goods, we got to make sure we have the sellers. We got to make sure we have the inventory. Um, we got to make sure we have the product. I like to have half the, half the plan be geared toward that top line objective, but the other half of the plan um, protect the downside, right? Almost a collar. And so we had to walk our board through the way we were thinking about this, but we said, here is a, I'm gonna make up the numbers, a hundred million dollar TCD plan. And here are all the investments we're making in sellers and quota coverage and homologation of the product for these different international go-to-market moves. Um, but our cash flow statement, only our cash flow statement, the cash receipts line and the line of credit we have for accounts receivable, we're going to assume that we don't hit 100 million, we hit 60 million from a cash flow standpoint. And then you have to adjust your headcount and your spend and your program spend accordingly. But that way, you can invest in having the sellers to achieve the objective because it's a foregone conclusion that you won't if you don't have that in place. Um, but you're also protecting from um, saying, yeah, my, um, my runway just, just got shortened by three months. Um, so I plan from a cash receipt standpoint for a downside scenario, but I invest to achieve the upside. Hey, Dave, I think you're on mute. Good point. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> um, that's a great perspective, Laura. Thank you. That, that good insight. And Mike, you know, you were mentioning about standardizing and templatizing uh, a bit earlier in our discussion. And calendarize. That's the one I used to say, too. Calendarize. Calendarize, too. I forgot that one. Yes. Standardize, templatize, and calendarize. Got Make it. Everything repeatable. There <laughs> you go. And so when it comes to scenario planning, Mike, and, you know, at Gusto, when COVID hit or at DoorDash as an example, um, how specific were some of your uh, plans? How granular, how detailed were they? Yeah, so maybe maybe the, the one thing to zoom up a little bit, I think all this conversation has to start with, you know, how critical is it for your business and what is your runway? Because if you have so much capital that you have a five-year runway, runway and we're going through what we're going through now, and you don't really know, you don't have to necessarily be as exact as you do with, there's a company that I, I'm working with that has basically two months of runway, right? So every dollar matters. In fact, they need to cut, obviously, but trying to raise capital. So anyways, I think, you know, that context matters when we're thinking about all this, all these conversations, you know, how, what, you know, what is runway, you know, that that's, can give you a buffer. And so you can be a little more aggressive and it goes back to growth. So you can kind of lean in a little bit more, a little longer, um, not be foolish, but, you know, something else that Laura said, I think is worth highlighting again, and it's, it's thinking strategically about the changes you should make. And there's no better time for a CFO than, than downturns or, or market turmoil, because all of a sudden the voice of the CFO is much greater. So it's up to you to be even more strategic, but you can drive change faster. 
because you have, you know, as I say, a much bigger voice. And so you can, you can drive those changes that perhaps you think should have been driven before. Mm -hmm. You don't have as big a voice in good times. So anyways, I think that's important in terms of granularity. I mean, Gusto is an incredibly detailed company in terms of planning. Maybe, maybe DoorDash is a better example where it's an unbelievably complicated business and plans were different per city, basically, because it matters if there's a baseball game on, right? I mean, so all of a sudden you have a three-sided marketplace where small things matter, hot days, cold days matter, rain, you know, whatever it is, it all matters. And there's different things happening in different geographies and in different cities. And so there was a roll up of, you know, hundreds of different plans and it's very data-driven. And so again, it kind of depends on, you know, the, the data inputs from say a DoorDash come from the system or from Gusto similar. And then we have macroeconomic signals and other data sources that then drive and feed into the plans and so on. Something like, something like DocuSign <clears throat> is a little more, you know, sales driven. And so, okay, you start to get into the more traditional planning of looking in Salesforce and trying to figure out what deals are going to close when and how you might haircut those, what the reps think, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, really, again, it depends on, on the type of business and what you can leverage to plan. Um, so Gusto, DoorDash, incredibly detailed. And then you get into the expense side, maybe more standard, but on the top line side, you know, really sophisticated. And there's teams of folks, including data scientists working on the forecasts. So it's not just sort of CFO and sales team. Yeah. And there was actually a question that just came from the attendees about, are there any specific tools that you would highlight that you use for scenario planning? Are there any software tools or is it just your standard um, kind of software ERP suite? Excel. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I, sure. I, I don't know about everybody else, but I, you know, in my, my career, I found that adaptive was just the easiest one and the cheapest, uh, but not to do, not to do replanning just for the sort of base expense plan, but agreed Google Sheets or Excel, Google Sheets is pretty good now. Yeah. Uh, and it's, it's obviously uh, easier to collaborate, but um, yeah, I don't think there's anything else. Yeah. I think you memorialize an adaptive planning or whatever yeah. planning tool you have. So it's there, but uh, a lot of the analysis, the modeling, the scenario that's just done in Excel and, you know, yeah. your financial analyst manager probably have their own model based on what business they, they run. And there's, they would know better than you on how to model that part of the business. Uh, and then you put it into a, as you say, a templatized uh, place where you can do rollups and, and things like yeah. that. But the, the heavy brain work and critical thinking is usually done in Excel, even at giant companies. And maybe articulated at the board level in, in, uh, in slides, right? Where you just have big chunks, you know, red, yellow, green is, is better for boards than... <laughs> Massive detailed spreadsheet. Only, only three bullet points for the board. No more than that. Yeah. Well, well, we'll get to that. Actually, there was a question about communication. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, but, you know, the, the area I'd like to go to next is actually some of the more tactical specific items. So, you know, imagine where the decision has been made uh, within an executive team that we do need to implement cost cutting measures. Um, what, what are your what, what's your collective guidance? And, and Laura, I'll start with you just about, you know, you touched on this a little bit about cost cutting measures, right? Is this a broad based, you know, 10% across the board, no one is spared, or, or is it more surgical and tactical where cost cutting needs to happen? I would say the latter by far, uh, in my experience, the latter. And let me frame this by saying, I, I, this is not a great term, but I've started to think of things as a minimal viable next financing. We think about, okay, what is our minimal viable go-to-market offering? Um, so in, in my mind's eye, of course, we're always trying to increase valuation, reduce dilution. But if, if you have a financing that's within your horizon and you're planning for that, um, I think this was said you know, by both Robert uh, and Mike earlier, just in terms of know where you want to go, right? Know who your comparative company is, know, you know what metrics are going to be um, expected, who knows what the multiple forward ARR is going to be in, in, in 18 months, but you have to anticipate that. And you have to say, if I, if I force this spend reduction on the business, what am I going to have achieved by that point? Whether it's number of end users, whether it's number of devices attached, whether it's you know square foot of coverage and wireless that we can achieve, um, the kinds of clients that we want to, to bring on, right? What does that minimum viable thing look like? And then invest in things that will achieve the return within the time frame. And 
you know, we, we discussed this just a, a bit ago about having some back pocket growth vector for the future. And so things you wanted to do, um, you know, it could be uh, a, a, a homologation in a, in a go to market geo, or it could be hardening the product for Fed use and, you know, getting Fed certifications, that kind of thing, where you say, I'm just putting this growth vector aside because I can't afford it right now. But I am going to look for somebody to finance that, right? I'm going to look for a customer or an investor or a vendor. Maybe it's NRE. You know, we 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 respond to these RFPs to get NREs to cover things that we don't have financed right now. Um, but I believe in properly investing in the things that are the most important to achieve what your highest level objectives are. And as, if it's attracting you know, a great series C or a great series D, I'm going to, I'm going to think about that, but a hundred percent, I don't believe that all dollars are created equal. Um, there are just some things that you're going to get a much greater return on your investment and some things, technical debt, retirement and engineering. And even, you know, I'm a, I'm a growth person and I love to put systems in place and, you know, get ready for that hockey stick. But I just kicked out a ERP implementation by six months because it wasn't going to make a difference to the top line. Um, and so I think being brutal about the things that are going to give you the highest level of return is the only way to go. Got it. Makes sense. And then, Robert, turning to you, you know, as far as other cost cutting measures, uh, we chatted a little bit about this, but, you know, what, what are your thoughts about, you know, the, the various options that may be available to a finance leader from obviously just a riff? to salary cuts or targeted you know expense management do you have, have any suggestions or experience for the folks about you know which which tactics to try and which maybe avoid yeah to start off with i think it's the same for most of these companies 65 70 percent of your your expenses are people so it's going to have to impact people in some way i mean you got hard costs aws other things that you just are immutable so if you take away the things, the TAM, I call it the TAM of expenses, it's going to be people. And, um, you know, once you make that decision, you've got to cut. I mean, this is a crude statement, but if you're going to eat shit, don't nibble. Um, you know, do it once and do it right. Um, and, and make sure you're not continually taking a little bit and then take a little bit more later. It's when you make that decision, it's a tough decision to make. Make sure you take enough where you don't have to do it again for, for quite some time, unless again, the landscape shifts again, and you can point to something sort of outside your control. Um, I haven't found that salary cuts work. I think that I think what you'll do is you'll create more um, brain drain, you're going to lose your top talent, including executives, um, they'll find somewhere else that has that. Uh, it's best to keep the compensation where it is, because you're just creating a compression problem for the next year. Um, if you cut salaries, um, they're going to want to catch up at some point. It's, um, I look at, you know, how do you tie your reduced expenses to a change in priorities? You know, employees don't want to just hear cuts across the board. That same sounds ham fisted. They want to hear we're going to be more focused, right? And that may, may mean consolidating product groups. That might mean uh, getting out of certain markets or segments. And you can tie that to the expense of saying, where are we focusing our dollars? And how do we tie that to our change in focus and, and prioritization? you're always going to have twice as much demand for R&D than you have capacity. It's just no matter whether you're rich or poor, I've always seen the case it's at least 2x, if not more, of things they want to do. Same with marketing. There's never been a marketer that doesn't have enough program marketing dollars. So how do you ruthlessly prioritize those to the, as, as Laura says, what are you going to get out of it? Is it really going to drive growth? Or as Mike said, we didn't hire a bunch of people and nothing changed. It happens all the time. Uh, you'll hear marketing. If you cut marketing, our pipeline will drop. Well, it didn't drop. Um, so maybe it wasn't marketing. Uh, they'll find another factor, weather or something that, that uh, caused it. <laughs> but you, you will find that you, you, you pulled something back and, it, and nothing really happens. So I think it's the people go to the makes sense. And if you're in a growth mindset, um, look at your go to market metrics, your bookings to OTE. Does that look healthy? Do every salesperson need three sales engineers? Is that really what you need? And they need two customer success people. Look at the friends. If they don't bring in that um, higher bookings or lower churn, um, you'll find that they don't need as many friends. Or consolidate territories. You don't need as many salespeople because you'll look at the bottom performers. They probably have too small a territory or just they just can't do it. And you can get the same bookings with fewer people. In fact, the people you keep will enjoy 
the larger territories, um, if you think about that. So that's sort of the smart way to make the cuts while not um, totally destroying your, your growth potential. But as Mike said, it, it depends on where you are. If you waited too long, you've got two months of runway, you're going to have to do ham fisted. It's just, uh, you don't have time to um, pontificate on the prioritization. You're going to have to figure out how to get back on track short term and then figure out from there. But if you've got a little longer runway, I think you should be more thoughtful about um, doing that. So these problems don't age well and uh, um, every quarter matters. Yeah, yeah maybe I'm just going to add on that. that it is it is important that that any cuts are not equal per department. It's it's really looking at it through a lens of what has the lowest impact on strategic objectives, short term, and then obviously long term. I mean, that's what it has to be. So anything that we can do to not cut expense in places that are going to you know impact our strategic objectives or long term. So that's got to happen. And I think one thing we haven't talked about in the planning process is just the whole the whole slide around people and orgs and how orgs change and so on. But then also performance review process and how that how that dovetails into planning. So you know we've always done where you know it sort of rolls up and then the ELT member goes through you know how people are doing and which people are not doing well and then those people need to be terminated and that should be happening all the time. Um, and then there's this this idea that it's really about hitting our long term objectives and so if there's headcount in one group it should be repurposed as well. Right? It doesn't mean it has to stay because it's in someone's budget. When things start to change and we're starting to think about how we can be more effective, well, someone should raise their hand and say, well, I've got two recs. I think I can get by with one. Here, I'm going to give it to so-and-so because they need it. Or you stay within the same headcount in your group, but you go, all right, I'm going to have to let go the, the bottom you know, five people because I need to hire five other people to do things that I think are more important. So you, know, you might need to repurpose people. I mean, you can certainly try and repurpose existing people, but sometimes you have to make a change so you can bring in a resource you need to, you know, to, to optimize what you're trying to do. And I think that's important in creating a culture that you really will, you'll give up and say, yeah, I can, I can make do with less because whatever you need to do is more important for the business long-term and create that culture and really have, as you know, as you grow a robust performance review process and act on it and act on it. And so, you know, we would also do across groups at, at, at our ELT meetings and, you know, help people understand who your superstars are and why, because a lot of times you don't have any interaction with those folks and you think maybe they're not doing well and someone thinks they're the best person in their group or vice versa, where you're kind of sitting on somebody that you know is not performing and everyone else helps point out. And then, you, you know, that helps you make the decision that you need to make to, uh, to terminate that person. And I've had that happen to me both ways where I was blind and didn't see someone wasn't performing. And in those meetings, when we sort of level set and align. You go, oh, maybe you're right. I do need to move. And then and then make those things happen, basically. So I think that's a really important part is to be on, on top of who are your best performers and keep them. And that goes back to salary cuts across the board is ridiculous. Mm -hmm. uh, it's probably more likely you need to put in place performance bonuses to achieve results and keep your best people 100%. Yeah. That's, I, it, sorry, Laura, go ahead. I, I just, I agree with that. Um, <clears throat> as as uh, Slona matured in its growth phase, it's still early phase, but as it matured, um, we made a commitment that our team members, like we, we have a concept of distinction. If distinction, then we're gonna shoot for the 90th percentile on market salary. If team, we're shooting for the 75th percentile. If exec, we're shooting for the 60th percentile, right? So there was this concept that even in a traction environment, your performance, you could both um, mature and prom be promoted, but also get some great bumps so that we can get you to the 90th percentile if, if you, you know, to the point made, if you rate at that level. So I think you got to, you got to take care of your key performers. Um, and just the other concept here is this is a lead by example thing, right? The executive staff have to embody this concept of cash conservation, and you can do it in, in, in small ways. Um, one of the things I saw once um, a CEO do that I thought, okay, picture's worth a thousand words, and I just saw this picture. You know, you're at some situation, maybe it's all internal, and it's a dinner, and people are starting to pick the wine. Um, and CEO pulls out his own credit card, not the corporate credit card, and says, any bottle of wine that's over 30 bucks is on this card. And it's just, it's, it's not 
throwing a 25 page travel policy to somebody. It is um, from a culture standpoint saying we're spending, we're all shareholders and we're spending our money, right? And, and how do we wanna spend this money? So I really think leading by example here, whatever it means, who travels first class, whatever it means, um, you can't expect people to not um, make the same sacrifices or make greater sacrifices than, than you are. Uh, understanding that, you know, Sellers are special, and and you know frequent travelers are special. But you guys get the get the concept here, right? You have to um, walk the walk. It, it's a great point, Laura. And you know, in these difficult economic times, um, you know, reporters love to identify these stories where executive teams did not necessarily act in the best interest of the entire company, or acted in a very selfish manner uh, about cash expenses or secondary transactions that they did. And so in these trying times, these stories will come up and leading by example from the very top trickles through the entire organization. I completely agree with all the points, you know, Mike, you made about culture and Laura, you as well. Um, you know, I, one thing I just want to quickly touch on that was mentioned a bit earlier, and this is a bit of a perspective from a venture investor, if you will, in that, you know, ex the, the, the commentary in the market about extending runway, extending runway, make sure you have cash for two years, three years, four years. I agree with all of those points, but uh, Laura, you made a comment about, you know, getting through two years of runway without exhibiting any level of growth is actually a default dead situation unless you're cash flow profitable and you don't need cash flow positive and you don't need to raise cash because even if you survive as a company, this tumultuous period and it's two years or three years and you're alive, but you haven't grown, you will not be able to raise capital because investors, while we may say extend runway, the reality is we invest in companies that are exhibiting growth. We don't invest in companies that are just barely you know, trotting along. And so it is a very fine balance. It, it is, um, you know, it's easy to say cut expenses. It's very difficult to manage expenses while still maintaining growth. And to the commentary from a few about being very surgical and specific about where you cut while still preserving the ability to grow is really the key to this puzzle candidly. And, and um, you know, that's what we spend a lot of time with our portfolio companies on. You know, it looks like, unfortunately, we're getting close to the end of time. And uh, we did have a question about communication from the attendees, which we'll follow up at a later time. But the, the one last question I, I wanted to pose to, to the panelists is uh, it's sort of a, a metaphor that Milton Friedman used, which is the fool in the shower concept um, as applied to macroeconomics, where changes are made but you don't wait long enough to see the results. And I think, Laura, you mentioned the point about clarity. Um, how do you think about implementing changes and seeing the results of those cash changes without being too reactive too quickly and maybe implementing yet another riff, let's just say, or waiting for the, the benefits of efficiency to kick in? What, what would your suggestions be about taking action and then letting it Germany. I think we're not, no one's sure. Everyone's like, well, who's going to talk to this? Yeah. Person, I think <laughs> it's a jump ball. <laughs> it's a jump ball. Uh, well, Robert, you, you had the uh, comment about if you're, if you're going to eat shit, don't nibble comment. Um, what, what, what's your suggestion on how long, you know, companies should wait before taking action again, if necessary. You're on, you're on mute I'm now, Robert. I've never used video conferencing before. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, I think it really depends on what's, where you are, where your situation is. If you've got a little bit more luxury of time to think about it, you may have that time to, to see it burn in, but a lot of startups don't have the luxury of time right? They're in a knife fight in a phone booth. So uh, that time is for your time for your competitors to steal market share, time for you to become irrelevant. Um, so again, when it comes to making the changes, find that signal, right? Any signal um, as quickly as you can. You know, unfortunately for a lot of enterprise SaaS businesses, you don't get that signal to the last three weeks of a quarter. Um, it's just, I don't know what to do. I, that's, if that's something, Mike or Laura, you can solve the hockey stick of, pipeline coming in, but the deal's coming in the last four weeks of every quarter, 
you'll see a lot of activity, but they just don't sign to say, did, did you really impact sales? Did you really impact bookings, order size? Um, but try and get that signal as soon as possible because uh, in the startup mode, again, you don't have that luxury of time. If you're a company like Dolby has been around since 1965, we have a little more time to think about changes and how that evolve over time. But being at uh, venture backed where you're running on someone else's money, you're running on their time. So uh, they want to know how you're deploying their cash and is it working? And there's no, there's no patience for that. So finding any signal versus I'm just waiting is not a great answer when a board member says, did it work? Any impact? Find that signal as quickly as you can, um, especially if you're in a startup and looking for growth. Yeah, I, I think there's something around going back to all the planning process stuff we talked about and, and having discipline and good planning process and so on. But there's a vector here around size of company, and it's a lot harder to change and make quick changes in, as companies get larger. And so then you have to rely on, you know, you have, you can make faster changes in bigger companies as long as you have great systems. So for, for everyone here, it's just really focusing, part of your job is building all of that. And clearly you can make quicker changes and see the reaction much faster in smaller companies, right? So I think there's, there's something there to, to be aware of. And then it's what signals do you have also dictates how quickly you need to make those changes. Meaning again, the, the Gusto example of economic data that helps us understand what's happening means we have the luxury of moving a little slower or faster. Um, but anyways, there's, there's something around that. And, there's also something that's around making change too much, too fast within companies that just gets people tired and they, they feel like they're being jerked in all these directions. And you know, that creates chaos within companies as well. So there's, there's a little bit of steady at, steady at the wheel uh, that I think matters here as well. Right. I'll just offer Dave that safety nets help here. Um, and I'll use a, a leverage instrument as an example, right? You can go to your bank and you can get an asset-based standby line of credit. You can use your AR as collateral. You can use inventory as collateral. And that to me is healthy debt, right? You're not over your skis. You're literally just getting an advance on something, either the conversion of your inventory or the payment of your AR. But I always throw in a piece of uh, straight debt in there that can be drawn at will. And you have to pay for that, right? There's a convenience fee there. But what it tells me is I'm going to put this leverage vehicle in and here's how I'm going to help finance it. And then if uh, it takes longer for that hot water to come through that pipe. Um, I have I have a safety net, right? I can pull that that debt in, and it 100% depends on where you are in your life cycle. But if you're if you're within 18 months of doing a venture financing, um, the kiss of death is to tell that new lead that there has to be debt retirement, term debt retirement, right? That's use of proceeds. Nobody wants that use of proceeds. So I try not to use it. I don't like. To, I'm a big fan of asset-based leverage, not a big fan of term, um, but it having an instrument approved and ready to draw allows you in those instances that you need, where you need to wait to see, um, it just, it buys you time. And get that debt when you don't need it. Uh, exactly. don't, don't wait till you need it. Uh, that's not a good time to try and get that. So think ahead. And if you think it's a possibility and you're flush with cash, that's a good time to secure a, uh, a, a debt facility. That's good. Excellent. Excellent points. Well, we have reached uh, our a lot of time. I'd like to just once again, thank Laura, Robert and Mike for joining us and sharing their wisdom and experience with us. It's been tremendously helpful. Uh, we had some great questions from the attendees that unfortunately we couldn't get to. So we'll, we'll follow up with those where we can. The one area around communication um, that was brought up. I think that I think that's a great area because as finance leaders, you all have to communicate and manage sort of and temper expectations of the CEO of the board and also the employees. And there are different ways of communicating and different messages that need to be sent to all constituents without just flooding all of them with data. And uh, someone made the comment about three bullets to the board and red, yellow, green to the board. And there's some truth to that and there's some merit to that. Um, and so maybe that's something for us to discuss another time. But once again, thank you all so much. We, we really appreciate it. Uh, and, I'm, and I know uh, our attendees really appreciate your insight as well. Dave, okay, thanks for having us. And great to see you, Laura and Mike. Thanks, thanks all. all. Appreciate it. Take care. Bye.